that we do thank you as we had a chance to spend time with friends, with family, around the table, breaking bread, eating, Lord, out of the abundance of things that we have. And Lord, we don't take it for granted, Lord. You have blessed us beyond. And so, Lord, we just want to return a heartfelt thanks to you. And we even thank you for your word as we are able to open it this morning and, and eat of it. Lord, it is food for our souls. And we pray that our soul, our spirit man will be strengthened and encouraged this morning. If we are heavy laden, Lord, that we will lay down those burdens at your feet and that you will strengthen us and encourage us, Lord. Lift up our heads and strengthen us with your righteous right hand. So we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word and all those who hear it and all God's people said, amen. amen. Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head, his face like the sun and his feet like a pillar of fire. Uh, if you will pause right there. If you remember, those of you who were with us from the beginning, Je uh, Revelation chapter 1, it gave a description of Jesus Christ. And some of these that are being shown here, that uh, we're reading here, uh, was some of the descriptions that was used for Jesus Christ. That you, you hear of the, 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 the fire, his foot, you see the glow, the rainbow, uh, his face like the sun. And for this reason, people will speculate, I believe even Pastor Chuck, uh, those of you who know Pastor Chuck, actually believe this is a reference to Jesus Christ. Um, I disagree. <laughs> and I'll tell, I have my reasons why, and I'll show you in a minute. But I believe this is none other than just an angel that was in the presence of God. You see, when you spend time with God... There's something that happens. Do you remember when Moses spent time in the presence of God on Mount Sinai? What, what happened to him? He came down with a glowing face. He actually had to put a, a veil over his face. And I believe in the same way when you and I spend time with God, the living God, that there's something that happens on the inside and it makes its way on the outside. Uh, you know, as has been said, that you, you, you become or you start to resemble those who you hang out with, right? Some of you, you know, are looking more like your husbands or looking like your wives, you know, maybe without the beard, right? I remember my wife and I, we were walking through, uh, through Publix and uh, we were approached by a woman and she was like, are you guys brothers and sisters, you know? No, I love her in different ways, you see. Uh, but, but she is my wife and, and just hanging out with her, I become more like her, she become more like me. You see, you are, you become who you hang out with. And some people have dogs and they, you know, yeah. stick a, you know, look, start resembling their pets, you know, in different way. But the, the, the fact is, we need to re resemble Christ. And our character needs to be that of Christ. And some of us, when we become a Christians, we want to change our lives. And, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to change this, and I'm going to... And we try to do things to make ourselves more like Christ. But listen, understand this. This is what makes Christianity unique. The Bible says, God in us, the hope of glory. The more you just spend time with Jesus, the more you resemble him, the more you become like him. That's all you need to do. Just sit at his feet, and he is the one that's going to change you. And so... Uh, I love to see when people come to church and just sit, whether it's Sunday or Wednesday or we have the small groups, just sit at the feet of Jesus and watch your life change. If you remember this, um, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, when the church was born and the apostles, they went out and they were starting to be persecuted, uh, but it said in, in Acts chapter 4, it says, Isn't, aren't these the guys that were hanging with Jesus. You know, because they, they said they were, they were unlearned men. They didn't have an education, but men, when they spoke, they spoke with clarity, they spoke with power, they spoke with authority. And so their conclusion, those who were seeing this, they said, 
They had to have been with Jesus. And that's what happens when people see our life. They say, you must be a Christian because your life, man, you don't have all these turmoil. You don't have all these, the, even though you're going through stuff, you still have a smile on your face. You still are glowing, you see. That's spending time with the Lord. So this angel is coming from the throne. He uh, it describes him, but look at verse 2. He had a little book open in his hands, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as with a, lo a lion, as when a lion, excuse me, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when he, the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, set up, Seal up the things which uh, the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Now, in something interesting here. We see this angel have a book or some of your translations say a little scroll in his hands. And he, his, his right foot is on the, the sea and the left foot is on the land. It speaks of authority. It speaks of ownership. It speaks of, well, you see, notice that he had this book. And when he cried out with a the voice of a, uh, when he cried out as a lion, now we hear seven thunders, seven thunders uttering their voices, and we're not told what what these thunders were saying. And as John was hearing this, and as he was about to write, as he's getting revelation, he heard this voice say, "Seal it up, zip it up, don't write it. I don't want anyone to know." what they're saying. Now, very interesting, in the book of Daniel, Daniel had revelation as well. And Daniel wrote down the revelation, and God, and he was asking God for clarity, can you tell me, can you reveal? And God said, seal it up, Daniel, it's not for you to know. But in time, and I believe in our time, we will begin to understand as we read these revelations and see and compare it to what's going on in our world, we begin to have understanding. But for John, he told him, don't even write it down. Seal it up. Now, I, I want to point this out. You see, sometimes when God speaks to us, when he gives us personal revelation, listen, it's for you. It's for you and for you alone. Uh, if you've ever been sitting in your seat, pastors teaching, whether it's myself or someone else, and you're thinking, man, this is good. If only so-and-so was here. Or some of you may be sitting next to your, your husband and you're elbowing him like, this is for you. I hope you're getting this, you know. He is all sore, you know, because of that. Listen, God is speaking to you, not to your husband. He's speaking to you, not to the empty seat. He's speaking to you. And he's given you personal revelation. And sometimes we want to share that revelation when God is saying, no, I just want you to gain this. I want you to understand this. I want to speak to you. And not to someone else. If, they, if he needed to speak to them, they would have been here, right? He wants to speak to you. You see, because God is into a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And so, therefore, when we search God's word, sometimes he may give you a word for someone else. And this is one of the, the hardest struggles even for me as a pastor because every time I got, get in God's word, I'm thinking, oh, man, this, I can't wait to share this with the congregation. But every now and then the Lord will say, no, no, no. This is for you. I want you to apply this to your life. I want you to make some changes in your life. And that's what God would sometimes do. So this revelation that John was receiving, the Lord said, this is for you, John. Just seal it up. It's personal. Now he says in verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hands to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who, cry, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that they should, should be delayed no more. But in, that, in the day of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God will be, re, will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as I said, I believe this is none other than just a, another angel and not the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in verse 5, again, it says that he raised up his hands to heaven and swore by him 
who lives forever and ever, the one who created the heaven and the earth. You see, whenever you see someone swears in the Bible, they usually swear about or swear to something greater than themselves, swear to the altar, swear to God. Uh, but this angel is swearing uh, not to himself because in, whenever God swears, he can't swear about, uh, to anything greater because he's the greatest. And so when God swears, he usually sw swears by himself. Now this angel, if this was the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have swore by himself, but instead we see him swearing to the one who created the heaven and earth. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, that all things were made by him, that is Jesus Christ, for him. We know John 1, 1 says in the beginning of his word, the word was with God, the word was God, right? And all things were created by him. And so we know that this is an angel. But notice what he says in that latter part, uh, part of verse 7. It says, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished. And he declared his, uh, to his servant and the prophet. So he is about to reveal this mystery. What is this mystery? Listen, we're going to jump right ahead, look into chapter 11. We're going to go there and go right back. But in chapter 11, verse 15, in the middle of verse 15, it says, the kingdom of the heaven of this world, excuse me, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, there's a mystery that's been uh, in, in the Bible for, for centuries that people are trying to figure out. Now, if you remember when Jesus Christ came, the Jews, one day they were saying, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were expecting Jesus Christ to set up his earthly kingdom. But when he did not do it, what did they start shouting? Crucify him, crucify him. And they put him on the cross. And they were a little confused because in the book of Isaiah, for example, you see a picture of Jesus that he is coming as this conquering king. But then we also see, like in Isaiah chapter 52, chapter 53, that he's coming like a suffering savior. So it was this mystery of, what, well, who is this Savior anyway? Is he going to come as a king or is he going to come as a Savior and die? You see, it was both, but you see, they didn't understand that. And so now John is saying this mystery that was there for all this time is going to be known. What is this mystery? This mystery is that Jesus Christ will come and set up his kingdom on the earth and he will reign forever and ever. And so he is saying here, uh, this is what he is revealing to John through this angel. Now in verse, verse 8, he says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take a, the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Now, it's interesting. I, I, I find this verse really interesting because uh, as we visited South Florida, uh, my sister's neighbor, he was Jamaican, and, uh, and, and he has this tree with these kind of herbs on it. And um, one of my brothers told me, hey, this, this, this is kind of like a good medicine, you know. And so he took one of those seeds and he gave it to me. And, and he said, hold some water because it's going to be really bitter. And so when I chewed on that little seed, I started to make faces, you know, like I've never tasted anything as horrible as, as that seed. And as I drank now the water, the water began to taste sweet as if it had sugar in it. It was the most amazing, one of the most amazing experiences. So I gave it to my wife to watch her face, you know, make, she like, you know, I, I thought she was going to divorce me after giving her that, but she didn't, thank God. But John is getting this revelation, this book, and he's being told to that, that he should eat this book, and when he eats it, it's going to be sweet like honey in his mouth, but when it goes down, it's going to be bitter to his stomach. Why is that? Look, look at verse 10. Then I took the little book out of the angel, 
hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy about, uh, again, about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. This book that, angel, that, that John is about to eat or that he's eaten is sweet like honey, but bitter to the stomach. Why is that? Listen, prophecy, prophecy. Whenever you see or hear of prophecy, it does this very thing. It's sweet. If, if God gives you a revelation, if he's showing you things to come, and even as I'm reading through the book of Revelation and I'm looking at current events and things that's happening, it's like, wow, it's sweet. God is, Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that as we will even look in chapter 11 and see some of the events that's happening even today, and it's sweet. But listen, it's also bitter because if, in fact, Jesus is coming soon, I'm sure every one of you in here have family or friends or loved ones that do not know the Lord. And yes, you want to be with the Lord. You want him to come back. But you know, if he comes back right now, some of your loved ones will not make it to heaven. They will, in fact, go through this terrible time of tribulation. They will suffer. Some of them will lose their lives because of it. And some of them, as we will see in Revelation chapter 13, some of them will accept the mark of the beast and be condemned forever. And so, yes, Revelation is sweet, but it's also very bitter. Look at chapter 11. Then I saw, excuse me, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. Now, this, I want to go back in history so you can understand what's taking place and what will take place. He's saying to, this, to him, take a measuring rod and go and measure the temple. What temple? See, those of you who are Bible students, you know exactly what this temple is. But I'm going to go back 3,000 years before. In the time of David, David was the king of, of Israel. He became king from a young boy. He was declared king from a young boy. And when David became king, before David even became king, God had given Israel, the people of Israel, instruction. Build a tabernacle, a tent, the size of this building. And in it, I want it to be divided into two. It's going to have the holy place where the priest will come and do preparation, but it will have the most holy place uh, where God's presence will come. And every year, once a year, the priest will come and he will sprinkle blood on this, what we refer to as the Ark of the Covenant, where God put his, he told him to put uh, the rod of, the, of, 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 excuse me, of Aaron uh, in it to put some manna, you know, heaven food that he was supplying to the Israelites, but also the commandments uh, that he gave to Moses. But once a year, God's presence will just fill that room uh, with his presence. Now, when David came on the scene, David was building himself a big house, a nice big mansion. And David as king said, you know what, this is not right, that I'm, I'm living in this mansion and God, his presence is in this old tent that's made of animal hide, you know, and different materials. And so David's desire was to build a temple, a really nice temple that God's presence could be in. And God told him, David, you will not build me a house. Your hands, they're stained with blood. You are a man of war. And so therefore, you cannot build me a house, but your son, I will allow him, Solomon, to build me a house. And so Solomon built a temple. David supplied him all of the, the, uh, the supplies. He bought the land and everything. And Solomon was able to build the temple. It was glorious. It was one of the, 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 the wonders of the world. People came from all over the world to see Solomon's temple. The inside, could you imagine? All of these walls that are overlaid with gold. Could you imagine that? And so it was a beautiful sight to see, but you see, uh, Israel sinned, and because of their sin, the Babylonians came in and they destroyed the city, took the people into slavery, into captivity. 
But some years later, 500 years later, there's a second temple is spoken of, we refer to as a Zerubbabel's temple, when the, the prince of the king of Persia came and destroyed Babylon, the Israelites were re released. And he declared that they should rebuild the temple. So they went back and they rebuilt the temple. But the second temple was nowhere as glorious as the first temple, as Solomon's temple. And so that temple stood until the time of Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of years before Jesus was actually born, uh, some of you know of Herod the Great. He was the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was still a little baby. But Herod was a builder, and he wanted to, to you know, make the temple even more glorious, and he did. He expanded on it, made it very beautiful. But when Jesus showed up on the scene, he said, temple is beautiful, but understand this, that it will be destroyed. Not one stone will be left upon the, each other. And so when the Romans in 70 AD came in, they burned the whole temple. All of the gold that was in it melted down, and they threw over every stone to be able to recapture the gold. And so 70 AD, temple is, is destroyed. So for almost 2,000 years now, there has, has been no temple. Now keep in mind, the purpose of the temple is so that the Israelites will be able to offer sacrifice to God, be able to have a relationship with him, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, so they have no place to sacrifice. For 2,000 years now, there's been no sacrifices in Israel. So 2,000 years, they, they're without that. Now, one of the things that Israel, as they been, have been rebirthed as a nation again back in the 40s, they have a desire to rebuild their temple, a third temple. Now, understand this. They want the temple to be rebuilt, but if you, know the, if you see the picture of Israel, of Jerusalem, you see there's a big golden dome there, and that's a Muslim's mosque. And that mosque is built right on the platform where the temple is supposed to be. So the Israelites, the Jews, they want their temple to be built, but man, they have to get rid of that mosque. Now, if you know, if they get rid of it, you know what's going to happen. World War III, man, is going to break out. But here's this, when it's very interesting, just as the king of Persia, when he declared that, the, that, um, that Zerubbabel will build, rebuild the second temple, when Trump became president, the Jewish people, they sent a letter to him and they encouraged him and said, you are like that prince of Persia, we are expecting you to declare that temple to be rebuilt. Now, a couple months ago, uh, Trump declared that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, and he moved our embassy into Jerusalem, which the world did not like. And, but again, this is bringing us closer to fulfillment of scriptures. Now, there's an a institution in Israel, it's called the Temple Institute, and what they're doing, they're training or they're teaching people about the importance of the temple and the sacrifices, and they have all of the elements, all of the gold, uh, you know, uh, candles and, and tables, and they're just waiting for the opportunity to rebuild their temple. Now, in last week, they had uh, their elections, just like we had our elections, and on their front line, they were electing a new mayor, and they, on their headlines of their newspaper, is saying, which of the the, uh, the, the candidates will be the one to rebuild the temple. Which one? And so they're expecting this to happen. Now, there's so much going on in our current event. Listen, and I'm just jumping ahead. I just want to drop this. We'll probably come back to you, uh, come back to this, this even, this thought here. But the Bible prophesies that in the last days, the Antichrist will show up. And he is going to have a ten-nation uh, alliance, and they will, uh, he, will, he, will, he will rule over them. The, print, the, uh, the, the president of France, he just declared himself uh, the, the god of Jupiter, and he also is, is asking or calling for a ten-nation, European nation, to join together. Listen, we are seeing things today that have been never seen before. 
And the, the prophecies of the Bible are lining up. And so we see here now this temple that, that God is asking to be measured is going to be this third temple. Now we know, according to Matthew and uh, Matthew 24, verse 15, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, 4, 5, that the Antichrist will come in this third temple and declare himself to be God. After two or three and a half years of this temple being uh, rebuilt, is, he's going to declare himself God. Now, the Temple Institute, the, one of the frequently asked questions that they have is how long will it take for the temple to be rebuilt? And they declared it's going to take about two years for it to be rebuilt because they have everything in place. And so, therefore, we see now this third temple that is going to be measured. In verse 2, it says, but leave out, uh, excuse me, leave out the courts, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will thread on the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out, the very location of where that Dome of the Rock, that, that mosque is in Jerusalem, they're saying that it's on uh, the Temple Mount. But some are speculating and some are believing that uh, according to you know, their research, that when someone stood in the holies of holies in the temple, they could see the east gate. And that is about 300 um, meters or 100 feet away from the dome of the rock. If you move just a little bit over, 100 feet over, you can see the east gate. So they're believing that where the mosque is is really not the exact location. So they're believing that it's a little bit further. Now, if that is true, that will allow them to build the temple and not mess with the mosque. And this will kind of fit in what's being said here. Measure the, the, the temple, but leave room. Don't measure where the Gentiles are, for it will be threaded under their feet for how much? 42 months or three and a half years. Now, this is very important in Bible prophecy, because again, this day of the Lord, this day of judgment is a total of seven years. The prophet Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, it speaks of the abomination that causes desolation. The Antichrist will come and declare himself to be God in the middle of that three and a half year period. And so here we have uh, these 42 months in the middle of this uh, judgment that God is going to bring. Here the temple is. Here's the Antichrist coming on the scene. And in verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now we see, excuse me. Excuse me. We see now here <clears throat> these two prophets that's coming on the scene. Now, uh, there's a lot of speculation on who these two prophets will be. Um, I have my speculation. I have my ideas. And I've read a lot of others as well. And my guess is as good as everyone else. But I want to point out these two prophets, they're going to prophesy uh, for 1,260 days. So another... Uh, three and a half years, they're going to be out there. But notice it says in verse 4, these are two olive trees and, these, uh, and the two lampstands standing before the, uh, before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceed from their mouths and devour their enemies and if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this manner. These two, they, these have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the, on, on the day of their prophecy. And they have the power over water to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So these two prophets, obviously they have some power and again, so who are they? You see, 
people will speculate, and I, I believe most people will believe and agree that one of them, at least one of them, is a prophet Elijah. And the reason why they believe that, well, the Bible said it, 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 it's appointed to every man once to die and then the judgment. Now, if you look through the, the history of the Bible, you only, you'll know that there's two people that have never died. That is Elijah. He was taken up into the chariots of fire. And the other one is in Genesis chapter 5, Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was no more. God took him, uh, took him right into heaven without him seeing death. Now, in a couple of verses from now, we're going to read that both of these prophets will die and God will raise them from the dead. So that's why they believe that God preserved Elijah and Enoch to be these two prophets. But as we read here, uh, some believe that it's not uh, Enoch, but it actually is Moses. And the reason why, if you remember when jo Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, two prophets, uh, two, sh two other individuals were there, and it was e Elijah and Moses. And if you remember, Peter said, oh, God, let us make three tabernacles, you know, one for you, one for Elijah, one for, uh, you know, Moses, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so most people believe that it's these two and some of these verses that we just read that they have the power to do what? Turn water into blood, to shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, uh, to call down plagues. And if you remember, Moses, he called plagues down on Egypt. He turned the water into blood, right? And we see some of these things that, that happen in those, uh, the time of those prophets, and now we see them here again. But I also believe, and I'm speculating again, that, and this is why I'm leaning towards more of Moses and Elijah, because they represent the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. What is the law and the prophet? Jesus said he fulfilled all of the laws and the prophet. And as these prophet, these, these two individuals, these, these guys are now speaking to the world around them, I believe they're sharing the law and the prophecy. What is the law and the prophecy? What is the law and the prophet? The law tells you what you should do, what we should do. If you look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not and thou shalt, right? What, what we should do, what, what are we supposed to do to get to heaven? We need to be perfect. But the law would say, these, this is what's required of you. But then the prophet will come along and say, but you're not fulfilling it. So he, they, these two, I believe, are telling the world, this is what God has required of you. And the other one is saying, but you're not making it. You see, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. That he sacrificed his life for you. And people are saying, we don't want Jesus Christ. We can do it on our own. We can make it to heaven on our own. And so as these two prophets are prophesying, and anyone who came against them, fire came out of their mouth and devoured them, and this is how they died. But look at what happened now in verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, I want to pause right there because that third word in verse 7, when they finished their testimony, when they finished their testimony, you see, you and I, we are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And some of us are afraid to open our mouths because, oh, what would they say? Will they reject me? Listen, we are called to be faithful witnesses of Christ. Whether it's in our home or it's in our workplace, in our community, wherever it is. And understand, no one can touch you until you're finished the work that God has called you to do. You know, the last company I worked for, uh, I really did not want to be there because it really was a hard place to be in. You know, the, the language, the, the, uh, I mean, I shared this before, they had a... a, a, a employee meeting, and after we were finished the meeting, boss said, all right, we're going to watch some porn, and I had to walk out of the room. It, it was a bad place to be, but God had me there for a reason, and when, when I was laid off, my time was finished. You see, prior to that, no one could do me anything because it was not my time. When, where, you may be in a place where you're just like, I really don't want to be here. But understand, God wants you to be there because he has a purpose for you there. 
to be his witness. So after they, after he, they had finished, notice it said that they were overcome and they were killed. And look at verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9, then those, who, uh, then those from the people, tribes, tongue, and nations will see their bodies uh, uh, three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. Now, this is so critical, so important uh, in, in, in Bible prophecy. These two prophets, after they're killed, their bodies will be in the streets, laying there. And it says that every tongue, every nation will see their, their bodies. Now, understand this. 2,000 years ago, if someone died in the street, no one knew except the people in that area that saw their bodies. 50 years ago, this was not possible. 20 years ago, getting close. Today, listen, as I was with my family, my brother was on the phone on FaceTime with someone in England. What time is it over there? 10 o'clock. I have a nephew that's in, in uh, Japan. We were FaceTime with him last year, uh, you know, as him and his family was over there. Live, he's on the other side of this world. A couple, I believe it was last year, I believe, uh, they had a camera, an eagle camera, because some eagle was laying an egg. Yep. And people from around the world was watching that event take place. I think they had one for a giraffe as well. Yeah. You see, I'm pointing this out to show you that we are indeed living in the last of the last days. This it was not possible, not even 20 years ago, but now we have cameras and we have in, uh, the technology that anything that happens around the world, the whole world can look in and see. Yeah. And these prophets will be laying in the street and the whole world will have, they will have the dead prophet cam, you see, and people will watch them. But I'm glad that it didn't end here. Look at what happens next. And their dead bodies again in, uh, will lay in the streets for the great city, which is uh, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So this is in Jerusalem. Verse 9, and uh, those from the people, tribes, tongue, and the nation will see their bodies for three and a half days and not allow their bodies to be put into the grave. Verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, making merry and sending gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So this sounds like a good verse for Christmas. You know, you write this down, they were sending gifts to one another. Listen, listen it's not a Christmas verse. No. You see, they were rejoicing because the prophets, what do prophets do? Well, we have a lot of people around today saying, oh, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet. And they will come to you and say, oh, God has some good for you. And they'll say all kinds of things to tickle your ears. Whenever a prophet speaks, you better be humbled. Because a prophet usually will come to you and say, if you don't turn from your sin, this will be the consequence. And this is what these prophets were doing. They were telling the people they are living in sin, and if they don't turn, judgment will come. And people don't want to hear that. One of the words that is being used today is, oh, the church is so intolerant. What do they mean by that? Well, if you tell them that the sin, they're doing something that is sinful and God will judgment, well, you're intolerant. Judge not lest you be judged, you know. Is it intolerant to tell someone what you're going to do will hurt yourself? No, that's love, my friend. And, and notice that they're saying of these prophets that they're tormenting them. They're not tormenting them. They're telling them the truth. But people don't want to hear the truth. So verse 11, now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Uh, and if you pause right there. So 
the breath of life from God entered them. So three and a half days, they're in the street, and God now raised them from the dead. And the ne very next word that they hear is, come up here. Now, we talked about the rapture before, and I believe these are the same words that we will hear when Jesus Christ comes for us. Come up here, and he's going to snatch us out of here and take us up into heaven. And so he put the breath of life back into them, and notice it says that great fear fell on those who saw this. Now, verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and the a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God, to the God of heaven. So every tragic event that happened, whether it's in these prophets or in our lives, God uses it for some good. No matter what news it is, maybe the doctor said, oh, you have whatever disease or whatever it is. Listen, continue to be a witness for God and God will use you. And notice that it says that people came to the Lord. They glorified God. They gave glory to God because of that. Now, verse 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seven angels sounded and there were a loud voice, there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their throne fell on their faces and worshiped God. Now, this mystery that we talked about in the previous chapter, that the kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. I don't know about you guys, but I am waiting, I am longing, I am longing for the return of Jesus Christ. Especially in the climate, the political climate that we're in. Uh, it's such division, it's such, uh, no matter what the issue is, there's always going to be two sides. No one can agree on anything. And I don't believe any candidate, any politicians can go into the White House and change uh, this world, because I believe, for one, the prophecy, prophecy tells us that it's going to get worse before it gets better. We can vote and pray for the best, but in the end, I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm looking for King Jesus to be on his throne to make things right. That's where my hope is. And so these uh, you know, the, 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 the mystery is, is revealed, and notice it says that all of the elders and all those who were before the throne, they fell on, the, on their face and worshiped God. And look at what they're saying. Give thanks. We give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The nations are angry at God. You ever notice that when you say the name Jesus, it's an offense to people? I mean, you think about who Jesus is. What, what, when Jesus walked the earth, what did he do that was bad? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. But yet, he is the most hated man on the face of this planet. He's hated. Why? Because you see, as Jesus said, as they, if, if they hated me, they will hate you. Because when you, you call that name or if you are called by that name, a Christian, you're a reminder of what's to come if people don't give their life to the Lord. But people don't want to give their life to the Lord because they don't want to change from their sins. And so therefore, they will hate you. But they hate him, they're angry at him, and his wrath is going to come. And then it says, and the time of the dead... That they should be judged. Who are the dead? Anyone who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're, they're dead. They're spiritually dead. And he says, and, they, and you, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. He's going to judge the dead, but listen, he's going to reward the living. 
who are to live in, every one of us that have submitted our life to the Lord. You see, salvation is, is a free gift. We cannot earn our salvation when we surrender to Jesus, when we acknowledge that he is Lord, we receive salvation. It's a free gift. But our rewards, he's going to reward us based on our faithfulness of what, he is, what we have done, what he has in, given to us. Whether it's to be a faithful husband, uh, a, a faithful wife, uh, a dedicated mom taking care of her children, uh, whether it's a business that God has given you, uh, whether it's a ministry he has called you to, whatever it is, when you're faithful with that, God will reward you in heaven for your faithfulness. Look at verse 19 now. Then, uh, then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in the temple, and there were lightning, noise, thunderings, and earthquakes, and great, and, 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 and great hail. So now we see, of course, you had the temple on earth, but now we see a temple in heaven. This is the true temple. The ones on earth was a shadow of things to come. God is going to open up heaven, and we're going to see his temple. And what, what, what is his temple all about is where he is. And where God is, that's where I want to be. Uh, we are going to be with him. And notice that the ark, the ark of the covenant is there. The ark is that box that God told the Israelites to build. And there his presence came. And so therefore, this is just telling us that God, his presence, will be in heaven, in the temple. And listen, that's where I want to be. I don't know about you guys, but that's where I want to be. And how do you get there? As I said before, that you give your life to Jesus Christ. Good works is not going to get you there. Giving tithe, putting up some money in a bucket, a tithe bucket, is not going to get you there. Joining a church is not going to get you there. Helping an elderly woman across the street is not going to get you there. Nothing you can do will get you there unless you repent Acknowledge that you are a sinner and acknowledge that Jesus Christ, he died for your sins. That's it. And that's the promise he has given us, that we will be with him and he will be our God. And I pray and I hope that everyone here has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ so that their names could be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and have a place with him in heaven and, and be able to bypass all of the judgments and and the, 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 the worst of the worst judgments are yet to come, as we're going to read in the coming chapters. But that's what we need to do. Make sure that we are walking with the Lord, that we have surrendered to him. And once we have surrendered to him, see, there's a second part of our walk, is to be a, a faithful witness. And I believe that every one of us have that responsibility. Yeah, we may not all be called to be evangelists and go and knock on doors and, and stand on a street corner or whatever it is. But we all have to be, we are called to be witness in different ways. In different ways. And whatever way that the Lord has called you, he, I just pray and ask that you will be faithful to your calling. So we'll close here. We're going to pick up next week talking about the woman and the dragon. And, uh, you know, speaking of the Antichrist that will bring the mark of the beast. And those are some interesting things to look into. So I hope you will be here uh, in the next couple of weeks. Let's pray. Father, as we close our time, we thank you again for this reminder, this sober reminder of what's to come. And Lord, we want to be, as these two prophets were there, witnessing to you, being faithful to your call, and even unto death. Lord, I know you haven't called all of us to die as martyrs for you, but Lord, you call us to die to ourselves, to put aside our agendas, Lord, and be busy about your business. So I pray that you will help us, Lord, to be faithful to your, your calling upon our lives. Father, we thank you for every person that is here. We even thank you for those uh, that are part of our body that was not able to make it here today and those who are joining us by the internet, Lord. We pray your blessing upon all these, your people, that your blessing will be poured out from heaven upon us. And Lord, that you pour out even your spirit upon us, that we may be faithful, faithful witnesses unto you. Lord, we can do nothing apart from you. And Lord, if there's anyone here that still is wavering, still struggling, still haven't surrendered, 
still playing the game of a, of a Christian, Lord, of Christianity. Lord, that you convict their hearts today and that they will surrender and truly this will be the day of their salvation. So we thank you, we praise you, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Hey, if you are here and um, maybe you are the one that this message is for that you haven't given your life to the Lord, but maybe you want to do today, uh, myself will be available. Donovan is over here to pray with you, encourage you. Uh, so make your way up front, see one of us. Uh, if you need prayer for any, uh, any other reasons, uh, we want to make sure that we are here for you as well. So I pray you have a blessed rest of the week, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. God bless.